let's go ahead and get started. Uh, you guys just go ahead and enjoy your ice cream and whatever else. And uh, I'll just drool up here while we go. <laughs> All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, tonight again, we're so privileged to open your, your word and see what you have for us. And I pray tonight you'll just anoint your word as it goes forth. Anoint my lips to say those things that you'd have me to say. And then let that one kernel, that one thing, let it just take root in our hearts and just grow. And anoint that, that it will grow into uh, something you can use in your kingdom. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. <clears throat> we're going to pick up with chapter 4 tonight. And we're going to learn about Haman's conspiracy against the Jews. Now, we, we talked about this last week. Um, you know, Haman's idea was to annihilate all the Jews. And this was based uh, uh, on, on several factors, not the least of which is he was an Amalekite. <laughs> so he was a natural hatred of the Jews to start with. And then it just went from there. And now tonight we're going to pick up on what, how Mordecai responded to that threat or that decree that Haman put out. So let's start verse one of verse uh, verse one of chapter four. When Mordecai learned all that had happened, he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went out to the city. He cried out with a loud and bitter cry. He went as far as the front of the king's gate. No one, for no one might enter the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. And in every province where the king's command and decree arrived, there was great mourning among the Jews, with fasting, weeping, and wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. All right, so when Mordecai learned of Haman's uh, decree that had gone out, he rent his clothes, that means the, uh, generally not, not the big heavy robe that they wore, but generally underneath that they had lighter, uh, uh, what was like a tunic, okay? And so he rent the tunic. He wouldn't rent the big heavy one. <laughs> Uh, first place, that would take a lot of effort to do that. And then also, it was very hard to replace those. So, I mean, it wasn't, that wasn't required. But the renting of the tunic, that, that showed uh, remorse. That showed mourning, grief, extreme grief. And then after he rent those, he went and got sackcloth and put on sackcloth and that was uh, you know we think about sackcloth we think about a potato bag or a, a flour burlap. sack you know burlap burlap yeah it was very similar to a burlap uh, it wasn't exactly the same but it was very coarse it was something that the poorest of the poor would wear really so uh what they what what they were doing was was putting off uh, their pride putting off their you know, heirs, I've got this beautiful tunic I bought, and they would rip that, and they would put on this, what would be beggar's clothes, um, as a sign of mourning and grief. And then put sackcloth, and then they would put, they dump ashes on their head. And oftentimes they would sit. Uh, we know the story of Job, he sat in a big pile of ashes and he threw ashes on himself and sackcloth and this was this was morning so <clears throat> the the decree when it went out would have been well understood because it would have been posted in various locations throughout the uh, the city and throughout the citadel itself probably not in the palace itself in fact, it most definitely was not, because she didn't know anything about it for, until Mordecai had told her. So it was not posted in the palace, but in the citadel, or in the, in the, the uh, um, fortified area that was where the palace was located. So that would be where the servants lived and so forth. 
it was a mini city almost there within uh, within the citadel. Anyway, that's where everything was posted. So that would be how Mordecai would have found out. And uh, he, he put on. If he had just put on, if he had just rent his clothes, people would say, "Oh, he's upset about something." You know, he's he's grieving for for something. Maybe he lost his job. You know, that kind of thing. If he rent his clothes and put on sackcloth, then there's something really serious going on. If he rents his clothes, puts on sackcloth, and dumps ashes on his head, that's the ultimate. He's grieving over an ultimate situation. Okay? So that, that's kind of how you look at the degree in which Mordecai was mourning this act. Um, and this act of putting on sackcloth and ashes and rending their clothes, this was not just something that the Hebrews did. It was well understood throughout all of that area in those times that that was a sign of mourning. Uh, you remember Daniel uh, in, uh, in Babylon put on the, the sackcloth and the ashes and all of that. Uh, and it was, it was understood. Uh, also king of the king of Nineveh, which was a very ungodly country, uh, when he found out, when he heard from Jonah that, you know, <laughs> hey, uh, God's going to come and kill y'all. <laughs> what did he do? Rent his clothes, put on sackcloth, put on ashes. Wow. And he had everybody in the town do it. So again, this shows, and, and of course archaeology and history point this out also, that uh, this was a very common practice when you had something, a uh, severe loss or threat that you were concerned about. Now, in order for him to do that, he had to leave the palace because sackcloth and ashes or any form of mourning like that could not be done in the palace. He had to leave. He had to go outside. So he went outside the gate into the midst of the city and he rent his clothes, he put on a sackcloth, dumped ashes on his head, and then he walked around wailing. And uh, when they says wailing, yeah, I mean, it means wailing, you know. Ah, no, no. And everybody's looking at him like, what's this guy doing? <laughs> Maybe Yoko Ona. Maybe she got that from him. I don't know. But uh, never mind. If you don't know who that is, you're lucky. I do. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but all he would do is walking around screaming and hollering with a loud cry, a bitter cry. So everybody noticed. Now, I think <clears throat> there was probably an ulterior motive here besides the fact that this was a kind of a traditional way of mourning. But also, notice he went into the midst of the city. And the city had a very, very large Jewish population. So what, in effect, Mordecai was doing was, and, and it's not beyond reason, that he was probably in the Jewish section of the city, right? He was letting everybody know, we have a problem. And anybody that would ask, he'd say, go look at that, see, posted, right? We have a problem. And so what was happening was he was encouraging, through his actions, the rest of the, of the Jews to go into a time of mourning. Now, it was felt, and, and remember, we're not talking about Palestinian Jews here. We're talking about Jews of the dispersion. So they didn't have the temple, they didn't have the priests, they didn't have those things they could go to, the prophets weren't there, uh, you know, what are they supposed to do? And so they latched on to this idea of sackcloth and ashes and mourning as a way of moving God. And, and to be honest, it worked. And it is a way of moving God. Uh, because in those days, it was all about the outward works. It wasn't about the inward works. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, today uh, we can fast and we can do things, and, and the Bible says, you know, don't tell anybody about it, just do it, you know, if, if that's what you want to do. But he says, humble yourself and come to me. He doesn't mean for you to put on sackcloth and ashes and come before him. We humble ourselves in the spirit and we... We come down before the Lord in the spirit because we, we're dealing, we are now uh, 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 residents of a spiritual kingdom. 
Testament, they didn't have the spiritual side of things. So everything was outside. That's why the law, you read the law, they couldn't do things, they had to do other things. Everything was external, everything was action oriented. And so this was their way of humbling themselves. And this is what God expected out of them because they could not humble their heart. They didn't, there was no way of doing that. Having said that, please understand, I'm not saying that God did not look at their hearts, but he was looking at it in, in, this, in a different, different view, a different perspective. It was, are these people earnest? Do they really mean, in other words, they put on sackcloth and ashes and sit out there and, eh, yeah, well, I hope they get him first, not me, you know. Uh, that would not have a heart or a purpose or a reason that was acceptable to God. But if they went through the actual outward things and had a heart that said, I really mean this, that's what God was for, if that makes sense to you. Uh, <clears throat> today, it's, it's exactly the same. He wants people who really mean it, but you can't humble yourself before the Lord today unless you really mean it. Right. There, there is no outward thing. You know, we, we, we don't hold special services here where you can come down and get on your knees and call, crawl through glass to get up to something and, you know, manifest this humbleness. We, we don't do that. God doesn't expect that. He expects us to humble our heart, pull our pride down, humble our heart. Um, so that's what was, uh, that's what, uh, what he was doing there. So he left, the, he left the palace and he went outside, but he returned to the king's gate. Now this is an interesting, uh, and, and there are several ways we can look at this. Instead of staying in the city with all of the other Jews, he went to the king's gate. Now the king's gate entered the palace, okay? That was the gate to the palace. And so he's outside the king's gate. And he's in his sackcloth, he's in his ashes, and he's got his clothes rent, and I can see him just sitting out in front of the king's gate, wailing and hollering and, and whining and, and crying. Um, probably there's two or three reasons for this, and, and all the commentators have different, uh, you know, some little different takes on it. Uh, one of them, I think, is that... Uh, he, and, and based on what happens later, he probably wanted to let Queen Esther know what was going on. But he couldn't just, you know, knock on the door and say, can I talk to Esther a minute? You know, <laughs> that, that didn't work. Uh, so so he's, he's making a public spectacle of himself right outside the king's gate, knowing that the eunuchs and the maids and all of them that took care of the queen had to come in and out of that gate just like everybody else did. And so to, I feel that was his major reason for being out there. There was also the thought that he wanted to let others in the court know what was going on. I mean, he's an official. You know, he's an official in this empire. Uh, he'd been there a long time. And here he is out there in sackcloth and ashes, and uh, he's not afraid to let people know now that he's a Jew. Okay. So this may have been part of that also. So he's out in front of the gate. Uh, there were, uh, anyway, he's out there, he's out there showing this morning, and there were Jews in every province provinces and they all had populations of Jews, some larger than others of course. But as each degree, uh, each province received the decree that was sent out, as it reached each of the provinces, they had this same thing happening. People were putting on, rending their clothes, putting on sackcloth and dumping ashes on their Wherever this happened, here was this severe amount of mourning. Now of course, uh, I, 
the, 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 the underlying reason was, of course, to catch, to catch the attention of God and have him turn things over. Although, in the entire book of Esther, he's not even mentioned. He's not there. And I think, you know, there's various reasons. One of the reasons, I think, here is that <clears throat> if it was stated that he was trying to get the attention of God or that God was involved, we might get the impression that this was something they just did, you know, to get God to, hey, God, I'm getting your attention now. And not really a heartfelt mourning or grieving for the, for the nation of Israel in the dispersion. Uh, and, and, you know, I'm, supposed, I'm just guessing. You know, I have no scripture for that. Uh, you know, this is one of my Alanises, you know, my ideas. But I, th I really think <clears throat> this, this book is written with the omission of God primarily to show that even though you're not in the presence of God, you don't have a tabernacle, you don't have a temple, you don't have any pastors, any preachers, you can still function and, and expect the blessings of God and the intervention of God strictly by your heart, by how much you really mean what you're doing, and then by actually doing something. Um, I've got a book uh, coming out, hopefully some of these days, I'm, all, I'm about halfway done. But one of the things that, that's in there is, uh, you know, if you want to be blessed of God, if you want to be used of God, if you want God to do something for you, then you have to be doing something. You have to be doing something. What the something is doesn't matter. And of course, as you all know, my favorite guy is Gideon. So this whole book is based on the experience of Gideon. And Gideon, when we find him, what's he doing? Something really spiritual, right? Pounding out a little grain, blowing it in the air, and filling a little bag with the with the where he's blowing the husks away isn't that spiritual and while he's doing that so he's really a brave guy hiding down in a wine press trying to eke out a living but the point of that is he was doing something and nobody else was mm -hmm. There was nobody. In fact, the Bible says the angel of the Lord sat under the tree and observed all of this. And it doesn't say he saw anybody. In fact, it says the men of Israel were up in the hills hiding in the holes, doing nothing. And, and it would have been so easy for Mordecai to say, ha, okay, if he wants to do this, we're going to get together. I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll leave. We'll just get together and leave. We'll, we'll just take off and we'll go somewhere. Maybe we'll go to Greece. Maybe we'll go over uh, to Pakistan or, or in, you know, maybe we'll go get a boat and we'll go somewhere else. I mean, he could have come up with all kinds of things. He could have went storming into the, uh, you know, and made an appointment, see if he can see the king and say, what's the matter with you, you knucklehead? You know, these are, this is how people react. But his reaction is what moved God. He reacted by going into mourning. Was he mourning himself? Was he Well, we will find out from his words when he talks to Esther, it doesn't appear that way. His mourning was the Jews. The Jews his people and, and there's a there's a there's a real uh, you know uh, nugget here it doesn't matter what you do as long as the reason you're doing it is to help or reach somebody else one of the things that <laughs> drives me nuts here well and not just here it's not just this church, it's other churches, but, you know, you can get up and you can 
You can push something you need, you need something, you need teachers, or you need something. And, and, and you can tell them, hey, you know, you really need to get on fire for God. And everybody sits there and says, yeah, that's true. Okay, let's go. 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, let's go. We're out of here. <laughs> really? Does anybody do anything? They may agree, but are they doing anything? There's a lot of things that need to be done. You know, uh, you know. I appreciate Lucy uh, and uh, um, ah, Juliet. Juliet. I don't know why I can't, I'm, not, I'm getting old. Anyway, they come down here every Friday night to help us feed people and give stuff out. Now, sometimes when they get there, there's nobody here. Nobody shows up. You know, sometimes we only have six, seven people, and then other times maybe there'll be a whole bunch will show up. We we just don't know. Really spiritual. We're gonna help. We're gonna feed them. You know. But in the eyes of God, that's something we're doing. It's something we're reaching. It's something we're caring about somebody else other than ourselves. We're mourning or grieving uh, because of their condition, and we do that by our actions. Is that making sense? That's what we should take from the actions of Mordecai. He was willing to go to the extreme in order to catch the attention of God and say, God, I'm concerned about my people. And because he did it, everybody did it. All right, it just takes one or two to get started doing things, and then you'd be surprised how fast people jump on board. All right, let's move to uh, verse 4. So Esther's maids and eunuchs came and told her, and the queen was deeply distressed. Then she sent garments to clothe Mordecai and take his sackcloth away from him. But he would not accept them. Then Esther called uh, Hathach, one of the king's eunuchs, whom he had appointed to attend her. And she gave him a command concerning Mordecai to learn what and why this was. So Hathach went out. It's probably Hathach, by the way. Went out, um, so Hathach went out to Mordecai in the city square that was in front of the king's gate, and Mordecai told him all that had happened to him and the sum of money that Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasury to destroy the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the written decree for their destruction, which was given at Shushan that he might show it to Esther and explain it to her and that she might command, he might command her to go into the king to make application, uh, a supplication, I'm sorry, to him and plead before him for her people. So Hatok returned and told Esther the words of Mordecai. Now, <laughs> uh, this, is a, uh, this is kind of an almost uh, comical little thing in here. Here's Mordecai out there dressed, uh, you know, in his sackcloth ashes. He's hollering, he's crying, you know, he's putting on this big uh, show, which is, which is what, you know, is typical of, of the Jews of that day. You know, their weddings, their funerals, it didn't matter. It was all wailing and carrying on, and, you know. That. So here he was doing this, and uh, Esther finds out. Sure enough, his plan worked. You know, one of the eunuchs found out and came, told Esther, you know, your uncle is out there, and he's got old clothes ripped, he's got sackcloth on and ashes, and he's sitting out in front of the king's gate. And I can see Esther. You know, put yourself in Esther. She says, oh, my goodness, what is he doing? I'm the queen, and he's dressed like that. What is the matter with that guy? Is he losing all of his marbles? Is that unreasonable? No. I mean, here's a guy who's an official. He was probably always came right on the dock to the king's gate, came in and sat down where he was supposed to sit. He was always dressed just right. And here he is out there doing that. What is wrong with him? Is he gone insane? And so she sends the eunuch out there and gets all the, and you know these clothes had to have been really nice, 
got all these really nice clothes. Go take that sackcloth out of him, straighten him up. Sure. But Mordecai refused. And you know, when we put on our mourning, when we want to reach out, when we're trying to get the attention of God for something, or we're reaching out to our community for something, do you know the devil always comes along with a plan that looks better? He always wants to change things. He always wants to make us different than what we want to be or what God wants us to be or God wants us to do. And, and you know, the interesting thing is it always makes perfectly good sense. <clears throat> so here he is. And he has the opportunity to get all new clothes and, you know, to walk back through the gate and take his proper position. He could have said, well, it's, it's not going to do any good anyway. He could have just said, well, you know, this is ridiculous. You know, why even effort? We're just all going to be killed or we're going to have to make a plan to get out of here. But Mordecai refused to change his clothes. He refused to change what he was doing. He refused to go or, or, or exit out, excuse me, of this severe grief that he was in. Even though it would have made him feel better, his voice wouldn't, probably his throat wouldn't hurt so bad from hollering. I mean, you know, we find all kinds of reasons why he probably should have, you know, probably should have just followed her advice. But he refused to do it. And when the eunuch came back to Esther, <clears throat> She realized there must be something going on. If he's refusing to do that, then it's maybe more than he's just losing his marbles. So he, he sends the eunuch out there again. He says, I want you to go find out what in the world's going on out there. Sometimes the things that we do that make the least amount of sense are the things that get the most action. And even in business, that's, that, that's true. Sometimes you do things and you wonder, really risky, but it gets you the biggest rewards. And here was, uh, here, here was Esther. Now, he got her attention. If he had have just changed his clothes, accepted what she said, would she have ever found out what was going on? Would she have ever went in and took a risk of meeting the king? Would this book even be written? I think we can, I think we can make the assumption that this is the pivotal point in the whole story. If Mordecai had not put on the sackcloth and, and acted like he was you know, losing his mind and refused to change, then the story would never be here. Sometimes it's, it's our personal determination as individuals to serve God, to do things the way God wants us to do them, to do what we feel to do, and to continue to do it until God says it's enough. When we do that, the rewards and the profits are far greater than we could ever imagine. All right. <clears throat> so we learn here a couple of things. Number one, the decree had not been pu pu published or po posted anywhere in the palace. Not just in the women's quarters, it wasn't there, but the eunuchs, they had free access to the rest of the palace. They would have found out and came back and told her. So they didn't know. It had never been posted in there possibly never posted inside the king's gate at all, anywhere. So nobody knew. Um, we also know that the women were kept uh, separate, and especially the queen. She didn't even know what Haman, or what the Mordecai was up to. She had no contact, no communication with anybody that was telling her anything until her units went out of the king's gate to find things out. 
Um, and we can talk about how sometimes we get information that, aren't, that doesn't always come from the pastor. doesn't always come from the Bible teacher. We learn things sometimes from some of the most inexplicable sources that turns into something we need to know. Don't be afraid to listen to what people say. Just don't take what they say at face value always. Or, I mean, take it to heart always. You want to take it at face value. But when the eunuch came in and told her what was going on with Mordecai, uh, it stirred something up. It was a eunuch. It wasn't a Jew. It wasn't Mordecai. It was somebody else telling her something. But it, 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 she used that information then to dig deeper into it until she found out what the real problem was. And when the eunuch came back and told her, showed her the decree. And by the way, there's an interesting little thing in here that we miss if we're not careful. The decree that went out probably didn't say anything about Haman paying the king anything. That would have been bribery. That would have been probably illegal under Persian law. So how did Mordecai know that Haman had offered 10,000 talents of silver if he could kill the Jews? Where did that information come from? Interesting, isn't it? But I think it tells you the position that Mordecai had because there was somebody that was feeding him information that was at that banquet, that heard that, and that knew what the reasoning was. Just something to throw out. You can think about that. I look for those little things. Sometimes it's funny. Okay. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> now, he evidently had taken one of the copies probably down from the wall where it had been posted of this decree, and he gave it to Hatok to take back to um, Queen Esther. Now, there's a statement in here, and that's Mordecai wanted Hatok to command Queen Esther to go before the king to plead before him for her people. <clears throat> the word command here... Uh, it doesn't mean command like it does to us. It, it doesn't mean, hey, you go do this. You know, it wasn't that kind of thing. It was more, Esther, you need to go talk to the king about this. It was showing a need and letting that need be known with a, uh, with a suggestion, uh, probably a strong suggestion that you might ought to go see the king about this since he's the only one that can fix it. Nobody could fix it except the king. Not even Haman. Haman made the decree, we found out last week. Haman sealed the decree because he had the signet ring and he sealed all of those 127 decrees that went out in all the different languages. It was his but he couldn't change it because he had put the king's signet ring to it and sealed it. Therefore, the only one who could change it was the king. And there's all kinds of things. We could take off on that one, but I'm not. I'm going to keep going here because I, I will turn this short lesson into a very long one. <laughs> so he wanted her to go... Um, um, before the king. Now Mordecai had the expectations that uh, Esther would listen to Hatok and made it personal by referring to the Jews as her people. Notice that. Um, that he might show it to Esther and explain it to her and that he might command her to go to the, uh, into the king to make supplication for him and plead before him for her people. Now this in and of itself is interesting. <clears throat> Knowing Xerxes, or Ahasuerus, his personality, 
He obviously had absolutely no concern for the Jewish people. I mean, he was willing to sign off immediately and have them all executed. Genocide. Yeah. So, so, what good would it do for Esther to go in and say, you know, those are people and, you know, wouldn't have done anything. But Mordecai knew that in order to get the king's attention, he had to tie her to the Jews. She had to go in and say, you know, walk in in all of her beauty, all of her splendor, and say, I'm one of them. Huh. You see, very risky. We, we think about the risk she took of going into the king in the first place. But now walking in saying, hey king, you know what? You're going to kill me with him in, in 12 months. So you better enjoy me while you can. <laughs> but you see, he was, he, was, he was alerting her to the fact that the only way to move a Ahasuerus was by making it personal. Personal. The only way that we get people saved is by making it personal. Uh, as preachers and teachers, you know, it's, it's easy to talk about them all the time. It's so easy just to stand up and say, you know, those sinners are all going, they're not going to make it. Hell's a high, hot place and they're not going to make it. And the person sitting in the pew is saying, oh, they ought to wake up. Yeah, they ought to go get saved. But when you make it personal, you're not going to make it. We don't want to do that because it makes people squirm. And I'm not, don't get me wrong, I'm not one of these... Uh, you're not going to see me walking down the street in front of the Tacoma Dome with a big thing that says, Hell is hot, you're all going there. <laughs> I've had it out with those guys, I don't know how many times, running them off. And full of hate. That's not what I'm talking about. If a bridge is out, and you know the bridge is out, and you're in the middle of the road flagging down cars, you don't say, Hey, cars are, the car's coming, I'm going to flag them all down. You take each car as it comes and you flag that car down. Not because you hate the people. Not because you don't want those people to travel. It's because if they go much further, they're not going to survive. And so, and so Mordecai had to have Esther make it personal. In this case, it wasn't the king. It wouldn't affect the king one way or the other. He was going to live on. As far as we know, there's nothing that says if you kill these people, you're going to die, you know, anything like that. Nothing like that. But he was going to lose something that was dear to him. One of his, his most precious possessions was King, King Esther, or Queen Esther. <clears throat> so she made it personal. All right, that's it. Um... All right, and this may have been the first time that Hatok understood she was a Jew. We don't know that. All right, so here is Esther's response now to Mordecai in verse 10. Then Esther spoke to Hatok and gave him a command for Mordecai. You're going to, he's going to send you with a command. I'm giving him one back now. All the king's servants and all the people of the king's province Know that any man or woman who goes into the inner court to the king, who has not been called, he has but one law, put all to death, except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter, that he may live. Yet I myself have not been called to go into the king these thirty days. So they told Mordecai Esther's words. Number one, no, notice it was a well-known law. 
This wasn't one of those court law things, you know, etiquette in the court that you all had to kind of go along with. This was a law. <clears throat> it was a binding law. It could not be broken. It was, in Persian law, there was no way of rescinding it. You didn't have a Supreme Court and a legislator and in Congress or anything like that. If the king put out the decree, that became law and that was law. And this law had been around a long time. So it wasn't one that probably uh, uh, Hazarus had anything to do with. It was no doubt his father Darius or maybe even one of the Medes before that where this law came into effect. So it had been around a while. All right. <clears throat> now this, this law had no exceptions. So even the queen couldn't go in there. We also can, can, can extrapolate from that that Haman couldn't either. You know, we often think Haman had free access and only if the king gave him the nod to come in, which he obviously did quite often. All right. The only exception was the extension of the golden scepter. Now, this golden scepter, you know, we, we think about uh, English kings and some of the uh, European kings, you know, they had that rod with a big thing on the top, a gold thing or a crown or some big thing. Well, all the pictures that depict the Persian Empire, and there are a lot of them, engravings and stuff, all of the Persian rulers had the same thing. And it was, it looked like a blade of grass. It stood up about the same height they were. But it was just this slender, it tapered, it was to start with, but it tapered up to an end, and some of them had a little ball on the top. But it was either pure gold or it was gold overlay. And that was the scepter. And they kept that in their right hand. There isn't a picture of, a, of one of the Persian rulers that he's not either carrying it or sitting holding it in his right hand while it rests on the ground. This was their symbol of authority and they kept that with them. So that was the symbol um, that was being called for. Now, Queen Elizabeth had not, Queen Elizabeth, <laughs> oh Lordy, Queen Esther had not been called by the, queen, by the king for 30 days. Now, no reason is given for this lapse of time, <clears throat> but it was evidently extraordinary. Remember, this was the king's number one wife. This was the one that he, you know, had in more than anybody else. She was the queen, number one wife. So you would expect that they shared the bed on a, on a very regular basis. And as we learned last week, all the wives were on a schedule. <laughs> well, she hadn't been scheduled for 30 days. Now, if your husband, wife, or whatever, or even any, just a friend of yours, doesn't contact you for 30 days, what do you think? <laughs> uh oh <laughs> And if he happens to be somebody like King Ahasuerus, you might think, oh, I'm in trouble now. Think about Vashti. Oh, my goodness, have I run my course here. So it wasn't just that he had to accept her, but she wasn't sure he even anymore. Going in without being asked if the king was thinking about replacing her, oh, the perfect excuse. She broke the law. Boom, off goes her head. Now I can find another queen. You see, you can start to see the little sub things going on here uh, that you miss if you're not real careful with it. But, but that's, what, that's what was meant here. I'm not even sure he likes me. So Mordecai, he responded back in verse 13. And Mordecai told them to answer Esther, do not think in your hearts that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Good point. One of the most powerful statements in the entire Bible is right here. Number one, he tells Esther, hey, you really think you're going to escape? 
She's saying, I might just be put to death. He won't accept me and I'll just be put to death. And Mordecai is saying, do you really think you're going to escape this? By remaining silent, you think you're going to escape? You, my dear, are a Jew. The law says, all Jews, you're going to die one way or the other. You're either going to die because he didn't hold out the scepter, or you're going to die when they come and kill all the Jews. Either way, if you keep silent, you're going to die. If you're not accepted, you're going to die. So what's the best risk? 100% chance you're going to die, or 50% chance. Huh. <laughs> you know, she didn't really have a choice. You know, it's, uh. So he took away her choice. Then notice this. And, and to me, this is extremely important because I think it really sets Mordecai's position before God. These are prophetic words. Am I saying Mordecai was considered a prophet? I don't think he was considered a prophet. He may have been. I don't know. He was obviously one of the leaders in the Jewish community. I think that's true. But he makes a very prophetic statement here. He says, <clears throat> if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise from someplace else. What a perfect place to say, God is going to deliver us. But he didn't say that. He said deliverance will come from someplace else. You know, we, we often want deliverance to come from God. And by that I mean we want to see a lightning bolt, you know. <laughs> Boom! And here's your answer. But it doesn't often come that way. In fact, I've never had it come that way. <laughs> it's always been kind of quiet, you know. You remember Elijah, that great prophet of God. He's running and, and hiding in the brook, and he's down by the brook, and what is sustaining him? You know, here comes an angel with manna to give him at the brook, right? No. The Bible says there was a crow, a raven, a crow. You know what crows eat? Garbage. Yeah. Now you see them out on the road, you know. And it said the ravens came and fed Elijah. Didn't come from God directly. Didn't come from an angel. It didn't just appear there like the children of Israel. They get up in the morning and there was the manna, you know, or there was a quail. Elijah woke up in the morning and there was a pile of who knows what <laughs> that the ravens brought. We get our blessings sometimes from areas that do not conform to what we think God should do. And Mordecai here is telling her, look, if you remain silent, we're going we're gonna to get deliverance. Now, I don't know where it will come from. I don't know how it will happen. But we're going to get deliverance. I don't know if the Greeks are going to come roaring in here and kill all of the Persians. I don't know if a big earthquake's going to open the earth and everybody's going to fall in. I don't know. But deliverance will come. You see, this was a statement of faith on the part of Mordecai that was not based on a previous idea that God is going to do something in particular. And that's where we get in so much trouble today. We think we know how God should answer our prayers. And so we fascinate on that. Oh yes, we need healing and God is just going to bring healing. I need money and I'm going to walk out the next day and it's going to be a pile of hundred dollar bills sitting on my front porch. Am I right? You see, when we tie it to God, now don't, don't mistake what I'm saying here. 
When we tie it to God, we tie it to our concept of God, and we then tie it to how we think God should act. When we say, I don't know how he's going to do it, I don't know how I'm going to get deliverance, but I am going to get it some way. Because I believe God will provide from some way. I don't know how. We open up our faith into areas that we may never have thought about before. Sometimes God just wants us to do something. And, you know, just do something. And when we do the something, we get a mass award. We need money. Okay, well, maybe he wants you to go down and work at the fair. <clears throat> I'm going to work the fair this year, not because I need the money, but I have well, this something, something crazy. You know, they needed ushers. I said, okay, I'll go usher. I've done that before a few hundred times. Anyway, uh, you're going to work the fair. Minimum wage. You know, you're not going to make a fortune there. You just, you're going to get a, a little pay, and that's about it. But maybe God just wants you to step out on faith and say, I don't know how I'm going to get it, but I'll get this. And you step into that role, and all of a sudden you step back and you've got everything paid for. How'd that happen? So, so God wants us to understand it's not, if we don't do something, somebody else will. And if we do something, don't expect it to happen, something to happen a particular way. Notice this, but not to say, but, you know, in the blessings of God, there's always a but. <laughs> he'll bless you, he'll keep you, but you've got to keep his commandments. But you have to believe. But you have to have faith. And but Mordecai's but was a little bit different. He said, if you keep silent, you and your whole house are going to perish. And this rang a bell in my head. If Esther was, a four, was an orphan, who was her house? Mordecai. Yeah. Yeah. Mordecai. What he was saying, if you keep silent, your silence is going to condemn your house and I'm in your house. Oh. I wonder how often our, our failures to do what God wants us to do and to, you know, he, he moves on us to do something and we don't do it. Whether it's talk to somebody or pray for somebody or, or give some money or, or, you know, we just have this God is speaking to us to do something and we don't do it. I wonder how that affects our house. Ooh. That's another study. Good point. <laughs> All right. He goes on to say, again, probably one of the most quoted scriptures or at least referred to who knows, but when you have come into this place, your place, as Queen Esther, just for this time. Mm -hmm. You know, I preached a few weeks ago on a purpose. We have a purpose. We may not always know our purpose. We think we know what, what our purpose is. But our purpose is actually every day there's a purpose may not be the same day, purpose today as it was yesterday, may not be the same purpose tomorrow, but we have a purpose every day. God has ordered our steps, and if he's ordered our steps, each step we take, there's a purpose for that step. And in the case of, case of Queen Esther, this may have been the whole reason, and from reading the book, uh, you know, hindsight, but this is spoken by Mordecai at the time. So he had this I don't know, a prophetic vision or 
understanding of how God works. All right, we've got to move on. Verse 15. Then, then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go, gather all the Jews who are present at Shushan and fast for me. Neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. My babe, maids and I will fast likewise, and so I will go to the king, which is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther commanded him. All right. <clears throat> a couple of things I, I want to point out here. Uh, first thing, uh, she called all the Jews to a fast. Today, what would we do? Do we have a fast line? No. We call everybody to pray, right? Do you see what's omitted here? She doesn't say fast and pray. She merely says fast. Why? Well, it's... it's uh, probably didn't want someone to say, oh, God, it's your will. It'll be their last dinner. <laughs> yeah, that could be. <clears throat> well, where were they? Persian. How did they pray? In the temple. Now, we know Daniel prayed, and you know, they, they bowed toward the temple, and they could pray. But when it came down to this kind of a prayer, it's when they went into the temple, it's when the high priest would go in. Not to the Holy of Holies, but the holy place. It's where they would offer special sacrifices. It was where they would do their outward things to plead their case before God. They didn't repent. They offered a sacrifice of a lamb or a dove, you know, oxen. Uh, so everything was on the outside. And, and, and these people were separate, separated from the temple, the priests, all of the implements that they knew would touch God were all gone. And they were left with one thing, showing God, again, their concern, their humbleness, their contriteness. And there's, it's interesting, she didn't say, just do a fast. Uh, she said, I want you to fast. Day and night. See, the Hebrews, when they fasted, the Jews in those days, they'd go on a seven-day fast. Well, they would fast during the day. When the sun went down, they'd eat. No, no, not this time. You're not going to drink anything. You're not going to eat anything day or night for three days. She stipulated day and night. This took away the Jewish calendar approach, or the Jewish way of figuring days. And I even had one commentary I was reading, he said, so it was probably only, uh, you know, a few hours because it was late in the evening on the first day, and then they would fast at night the next day, and then it was, so it was about a day and a half. No, she said all day and all night for three days. I believe she meant all day and all night for three days. They didn't take anything in. And I want to say something here also that might be controversial. But fasting for the sake of fasting will only get you hungry. Mm -hmm. Notice there was a specific reason for fasting. I'm going before the king and he needs to accept me so everybody needs to fast so he will accept me. Jesus, uh, you'll remember he was able to uh, cast out a demon and nobody else was able to do it. And when they came to him, they said, well, how come you can do that? He says, I can do it because or this kind only comes out through prayer and fasting. Fasting for what? For the demon to come out. Right. You know, um, if a few years ago, it was this popular thing, you know, 
to go on a fast. And the Daniel fast. We're going to go on the right. Daniel fast. Why did Daniel fast? He didn't want God to do anything. He wasn't fasting for a purpose. He wasn't fasting to gain something. He was fasting because the meat, and by the way, he only fasted meat. And the reason is because the meat was awful to idols. It was the king's meat that had been offered and blessed by idols, idol worshipers. That was against the law. All he was doing was saying, I have to abide by the law. I can't eat meat that is offered to idols. So I have to fast. In other words, idols can't eat the meat. Okay? That was the purpose of his fast. Read it. You'll see it. That's exactly what it says. And yet that became a fad, and everybody was fasting. Oh, this is how you get God to move. I, I, I wonder sometimes if God just doesn't look at us and shake his head. Get you hungry. You know? And, and I, understand, I understand humbling ourselves. I understand that. And I understand, you know, the, the ideas behind fasting. But like I said earlier in the lesson, we humble our hearts. We don't humble our outside. It doesn't matter if you're on your knees, standing, kneeling, sitting. If you're inside, if you're outside, I get sometimes the most spiritual blessings and I come into the presence of God sitting on a metal chair out by my fish pond, <laughs> watching the fish jump, watching the hummingbirds come by. I just sit there. And I can just go into the presence of God so easily. And yet if I get on my knees and I'm trying to get into the presence of God and my knees hurt so bad, I couldn't get anywhere. <laughs> now, you know, really. You know, it's not what we are on the outside. It's not what we do. It's how we humble our heart. And if we fast our heart, and I don't have any scripture for this, so please don't go look for it. But if we humble our heart, in other words, if we take away those things that make us happy in the heart, that are carnal, whether that's sitting down playing, I don't do this, but sitting down playing games, you know, uh, Xbox games, things like that, uh, things that, that, you know, can take the place of our heart where it should be. If we do away with those things, that's fasting in the heart to me. I don't have scripture, so I just don't look for it. You know. To me, that's a way of showing God what we want. All right. All right, so let's move on. So Mordecai left the king's gate and he called all the Jews and Shushan for this fast. All right, we've got to hurry. <clears throat> so Esther, let's look at Esther's banquets. Uh, first thing we see Chapter 5, verse 1, And it happened on the third day that Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the king's palace, across from the king's house, while the king sat on his royal throne in the royal house, facing the entrance of the house. So it was when the king saw Queen Esther standing in the court that she found favor in his sight, and the king held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. Then Esther went near and touched the top of the scepter. Okay, so then on the third day, after she had... Fasted. Notice she had all of her maids, even though they weren't Jews, they were all fasting with her. If she said, you don't eat, they don't eat. That was that. So you know, there was no argument there. But she had them all. And so on the third day, she went to the inner court. Now, uh, this was in the king's house. So the king had a throne room. And they have actually excavated uh, the one... Uh, at not at Shushan, but at I um, can't think of the name of the place. Here. But anyway, it was this large hall, rectangular, large, had columns on both sides. The king sat against the far wall on his throne. The throne was not a big, beautiful throne like we see. All of the um, uh, carvings and stuff of the Persian kings, they're on a chair about like this. Only it doesn't even look this comfortable. And it's got tapestries on it, which is probably soft. And it was elevated so that he had to have a footstool. So he was sitting about, oh, so much higher. Uh, you know, his feet would be about that much higher as he was sitting. So he was elevated. He could see everybody. He could see over everybody and out the door at the other end of the hall. 
and that door was always open unless he had a private conference or something going on. <clears throat> and this, the room might be full of people. There were people coming and going all the time, uh, you know, servants, uh, people that were there, not to see him necessarily, but carrying on business. A lot of things happened in the throne room. So he was sitting there, and out across the way in the inner court, here was Esther standing. And you know she had to put on her royal robes, the best ones she had. She must have been absolutely radiant and just spectacular. And Hazarus saw her, and whew, yeah, come on in. <laughs> yeah. What do you want? Come on in. Uh, so he brought her in. Favored her. Uh, and we talked about the rod. She came in and touched the top of the rod. Why did she touch the top of the rod? Nobody knows. Except it was probably the custom of those days. When you were accepted to come in, you touched the, uh, the top of the, rod, of the rod. Now, if you're granted permission to see the Pope, you're expected to kiss his ring. Oh. Mm -hmm. Same idea. Okay, just a show of homage. All right. <clears throat> Verse 3. And the king said to her, What do you wish, Queen Esther? What is your request? It shall be given to you up to half of the kingdom. So Esther answered, If it please the king, let the king and Haman come today to the banquet that I have prepared for him. <laughs> All right, here you have this. Um, she, she's been accepted. The king is expecting some really important request. He understands she risked her life to stand in that inner court. It must be important. Oh, man, she must up to half of my kingdom. Remember I tell you the devil can always thwart things or try to? Think about this one. Esther could have said, if I get half of the kingdom, I can save half the Jews. Oh, jeez. Huh? You know? Yeah. These are the kind of things that could have popped through her mind. But she was steadfast, and she said a very simple request. I have prepared a banquet, and I'm inviting you and Haman, and I prepared it for Haman. Oh. <laughs> you know, well, that's pretty simple. Uh, hey, George, how's my calendar look like? Clear me a spot for this banquet. You know, that's how tough that was. All right. <clears throat> now this was no doubt a relief to Azarias, as well as feeding his ego, since this was so important that she was inviting him to a banquet. So there had to be this ego thing, you know, that happened. And we know certainly it did with, with Haman later. Now notice also, the way she states this, um, that the banquet had already been prepared. So she understood that if she was accepted, the banquet had better be ready to go. So she expected to be accepted. Again, here we have a statement of faith based on what she did, not what she said. There was an action. Um, of course, she had an ulterior motive, and that was for the salvation of the Jews and for the downfall of Haman. I see here a, a, a just an absolutely uh, amazing uh, strategy and plan that she has here. She's pretty smart. <laughs> Very smart of how she could get how she could please the king, get him to change the law, and at the same time ensnare Haman and end up with him having bearing the brunt of this whole situation. So it was very well planned. But she didn't want to tell him right away. First, let's have a banquet. Let's go eat. Anytime, anytime, ladies, anytime you want to pad, pad, you know, to pad the way for something you need or want, just feed us. It always works. Uh, okay. Verse 5. Then the king said, Bring Haman quickly that he may do as Esther has said. So the king and Haman went to the banquet that Esther had prepared. At the banquet of wine, the king said to Esther, What is your petition? It shall be granted you. 
What is your request up to half of the kingdom? It shall be done. Then Esther answered and said, My petition and my request is this. And you can just see the king. <laughs> okay, we're going to find out now, right? She says, if I have found favor in the sight of the king, and if it pleases the king to grant my petition and fulfill my request, then let the king and Haman come to the banquet which I have prepared for them tomorrow, <laughs> which, which I will prepare for them, and tomorrow I will do as the king has said. Just read one a minute. <laughs> what a letdown! <laughs> Now, this was the banquet of wine. And just to clarify what that is, they would have a banquet. The first part of the banquet was meat. And that was where they would eat, you know, steak and potatoes or whatever. And they always drank, that, uh, drank water with that in the Persian Empire. They, they drank water when they ate their main course. After that course was done, the second course would come on. And that would, we would call it dessert. But it was fruits and dates and things like that. And it was accompanied with wine, lots of wine. So the dessert consisted of fruits and dates and wine. And so this was when uh, Esther, uh, when the king asked Esther what she wanted. He got full first, lots of food, now we got wine, now we got all this dessert. Now, Esther, okay, what do you want now? Oh man, what I want is for you to come to another banquet tomorrow. Oh, you mean I get to eat again? Oh, man. And you know this had to be really good. She, she probably flew in the best French chef she could find, you know, put this together. You know, this food had to be really good. Okay. Huh? Okay, well, I'll eat again. Now let's do it again. All right, verse 9. So Haman went out that, and incidentally, notice, Haman come quickly. ASAP, drop whatever you're doing. This is an important thing. We're going to have a banquet. <laughs> All right. So Haman went out that day joyful and with a glad heart. But when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate and that he did not stand or tremble before him, he was filled with indignation against Mordecai. <clears throat> Nevertheless, Haman restrained himself and went home. And he sent and called for his friends and his wife, Zeresh. Then Haman told them of his great riches, the multitude of his children, everything in which the king had promoted him, and how he had advanced him above the officials and servants of the king. Moreover, Haman said, Besides, Queen Esther invited no one but me to come in with the king to the banquet that she prepared. And tomorrow I am going again, invited by her, along with the king. Yet all this avails me nothing, so long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate. Then his wife Zeresh and all his friends said to him, Let a gallows be made fifty cubits high, and in the morning suggest to the king that Mordecai be hanged on it, then go merrily with the king to the banquet. And the thing pleased Haman, so he had the gallows made. <laughs> all right, so here we have here we have Haman, all excited. Oh, he man, he's on top of the world. Woo, man, I've got him everything, and he's riding on his donkey or he's walking or whatever, and maybe they're carrying him in one of those shawl things. And he goes up through the gate. And he looks out, and there's Mordecai. And Mordecai is maybe sitting on the bench, waiting to get called, and he just sits and stares at him. Or maybe he just turned his head away, said something to somebody else. He just ignored Mordecai. That's what this whole thing, when you look at the Hebrew, it says that he just really ignored him. And look at the reaction of Haman. <clears throat> 
it burned inside. He had such a hatred for Mordecai now because he didn't stand. He didn't recognize me. And he didn't tremble. Wow. Isn't it funny how people, when they, when they hate you or they're working against you, they expect you to tremble? To be afraid? And you know, the devil does that. He comes against us. He puts out decrees and edicts, and he goes against us, and we think that he's going to have, he's going to get us, he's going to get something, he's going to take over, and to tremble. The only thing that makes me tremble is God. Because unless somebody greater than God, whether it's the devil, whether it's an angel, whether it's another person or whoever else, unless they're greater than God, doesn't bother me in the least bit. Because if God is for me, who is against me? Amen. I have a big brother. <laughs> you know, I've got this big brother. You want to mess with me? You don't want to mess with him. You mess with me, you mess with him. Mordecai had that kind of an understanding. Even though it's not said, God's not mentioned. But Mordecai understood this man had no power. God has all the power. All right, so he gets home. And he's all excited. And so he calls his friends. And he calls his wife. And they're sitting around. And uh, here he is. He pops a bottle, maybe. I don't know. Pours out some wine. Who knows what they were doing. But he begins to extol how great he is. How wealthy he is. How many children he has. And in the Persian uh, uh, culture, the more children you have, the greater the esteem people had for you. The more children you had. Because a lot of them worshipped uh, uh, the gods of fertility. And so there was this thought, that if you had more kids, uh, the gods were with you, especially the gods of fertility. So, you know, you were being blessed. So, anyway, all of these children. And the king has promoted me now. I can't be promoted any higher. I'm as high as I can get, right next to the king. All of this money, all of this wealth, and all of this. And then he says, not only that, <laughs> the most beautiful woman in the whole kingdom has made a banquet just for me. And the only ones attending it is the king and I. Whoa! I have reached the epitome of everything I ever dreamed of. I am where I wanted to be. But then when I think about Mordecai, <laughs> This stuff doesn't mean anything as long as he's taking a breath. That's what hate can do for you. It turns everything sour. Yeah, that's another lesson. All right. So, what do they do? Well, they counsel them, and they say, here's an idea. Here's what you do. You go out and you build a gallows. And uh, you build this gallows 50 feet tall. Now, this was not uh, a gallows that you hang somebody on by their neck. The Persians did not hang people by their neck. Okay. What a gallows was, was where you literally hung somebody. It was a pole and it may have had a cross on it, but it was crucifixion. You hung them by nailing them or strapping them on this thing and letting them die. Very gory. Very much like the Roman crucifixions. Now, uh, there's a lot of thought that, that there was no real crossbar. It was a single pole, and they did it this way doesn't matter. They, they died the same way. <laughs> and they wanted this thing 50 cubits high. Now that would have been 75 feet tall. 
So that was probably a bit of an exaggeration, you know. But it was a very tall pole gallows that they that they put up. And this also explains why they could do it so quickly. You know, if you had to build a gallows in those days, especially with hand tools, you know, how long would it take to build a big gallows to hang somebody on with a rope and all of that? So no, this wasn't that at all. This was a pole, and they nail them up there and let them die. So <clears throat> that was what Haman had in store for uh, Mordecai. And notice this, he, they suggested he go into the king first, early, and have a word with the king about this, and have it all taken care of. And then when you go to the banquet for uh, to Esther's banquet, Mordecai would be up there thrashing away on this pole, and you can just be happy that you'll never see him again. Wow. And, and with that, we end tonight's class. But we're going to find out how God intervenes for Mordecai in a way that nobody could have planned. <laughs> Anyway, that'll be next week. All right. Y'all have a good week. Thank you. You too.